much for joining us for uh, one of two art and online dialogues that are part of ethics. Um, today I have the honor of uh, speaking to Natasha Becker, who's a South African curator. And we're going to have a great chat because uh, Natasha is so cool. <laughs> um, I wish I was cool and not, but Natasha is. So it's kind of that we started uh, in 2017. And uh, Art on Our Mind is based on the Bangkok's book, uh, Art on My Mind, and uh, which I found incredibly uh, inspirational when I first read it for how Bangkok's had, uh, in 1995, um, set up the African, you know, dealt with the aesthetics in African-American community, the seriousness with which it took the kind of everyday aesthetics um, as well as kind of what's fine art, or photography, aesthetics, looking at those within the African American community. Uh, and she also had a whole series of dialogues in this book of essays that she did with us as well. And so that became an inspiration for what became the Art on Our Mind uh, talk over the last uh, now three years. So uh, our model is that every three months we have a um, creative dialogue with a South African woman of uh, color artist. Um, because as you might know, um, we have many incredible women of color artists in this country who defy the odds by making the most amazing artworks. But, um, you know, unfortunately, this course has not kept up with the amazingness of their, of their work. And so scholarship has not kept up. And so if you try to find articles, uh, on and research uh, easily. Uh, you, you sometimes come across obstacles. And so Art on Our Mind, basically, we ha have a, a, a volunteer research team of uh, women students and, and Fuad. <laughs> <laughs> but he would say he's, he's, he's one of my favorite black feminists. So. <laughs> And uh, we, they, we spent three months researching uh, our chosen creative producer, and then we uh, have this creative that we generate questions as a group, and then we have this creative dialogue with the woman producer, and then we take all of the materials that we find, uh, that we've managed to find, and we put it on, the on an online archive, the Art in Our Mind uh, archive. And what we're hoping to do is not only generate primary primary research by these dialogues, but also to create a secondary archive so that uh, no matter where you are in the world, whether you're a you know, high school student or whether you're a, you know, a researcher at a top institution, if you're looking for uh, information on one of our artists, you can get it as easily as possible on the website. So that's what the idea of, of Art and Online is, is to encourage scholarship uh, and discourses around uh, South African women of color artists and the amazing things that they're doing. So, you know, all of you people involved in this course, catch out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna just jump right into it. Um, the format is uh, for the next hour or so. I will ask uh, Natasha a series of questions, the series of questions that we uh, have generated based on her life, uh, her experiences, her career trajectory and um, looking at what some of the inspirations are, her artistic methodologies are, as well as uh, looking at the challenges she faces. After that, we have a 10-minute quirky question segment, um, and then we have a uh, time for around 15, 20 minutes for, to open the floor up for, for questions from the rest of the, from, from, from the audience. Um, so, uh, let's begin. Hi, Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Charlene. Um, thank you so much for that amazing introduction because usually sometimes these kinds of things can read your resume, you know, your paragraph, professional, by, and whatever. And I think um, having you say that I'm really cool is like the best thing anyone can ever say about me. So thank you for that. Um, 
and I'm very happy to be here and thank you so much for inviting me because Charlene and I have been talking for many years about well since she started art in our mind, you know, when am I going to do one of these, when am I going to do one of these and I've, I've always wanted to do one of these and it's just the stars wouldn't quite align and so I'm excited that it has and that yeah, we are finally doing it. <laughs> so thank you for having me and for welcoming me. And, yeah. she's, and she's just gotten off, off a plane from New York uh, at 8 a.m. and she's heading off again. So we, we really are thankful that you, that you made That's this time available. Sure. Okay, first up, where were you born and what did your parents do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Retreat, in the southern suburbs of Cape Town. And Retreat is a, actually a really tiny suburb in Cape Town. It literally had 12 avenues and one main street. And everyone kind of knew everyone, or at least knew you go to the Catholic Church, you go to the Apostolic Church, you go to the mosque, you know? Um, so there was, it was very mixed actually, you know? We, um, had a, it was it was a it was a, a coloured suburb, but it was very mixed. We had Indian South Africans. We had a Chinese hardware store owner on the main street. Um, you know, we had a, it was a real mix of uh, racially and um, in terms of class as well. You know, we had teachers and we had labourers. You know, in the in the in the, in the community. So it was. Um, it felt like it was my world when you were a kid, as you, as you, you know, experience your street and your area to be your whole world. And it's only much later that I realized just how small that world was. Um, my parents were very young when they had kids, and so um, they were in their twenties, which means that they were. I like to describe them as, you know hippies basically um, because they were just so young and they had four kids by the time I think they were you know 25, 26 and um, my dad uh, trained as a carpenter so you could have a training, a, you know a certificate that says you can do something um, and uh, but his heart, he was in his heart he was a musician and when he met my mom, he was the lead singer in a band. And, you know, um, that, that was really his dream. So I grew up a lot with having this awareness of, you know, um, his desire and aspiration to have been a musician. Um, and music was always uh, around us. And my father's friends were always jamming on the front lawn, you know. Um, and my mom, um, I like to say that my mom could have been a writer because my, my love of books and reading comes from my mom. She was always reading anything, everything. I mean, our house was, you know, you'd sit on the couch and they'd be like, we'd have to move books. You'd, you know, go to the kitchen and you'd have to take books off the table so you could make a sandwich. You'd, you know, there were always just books around. And, and I think for my mom who was very young, had four kids and, you know, I guess her husband still thought he was the singer of a band, the lead singer of a band. Books was sort of an escape, I think, you know. But she, um, she made me curious about what she was doing, right? And so I, I get my love of reading from her. And I like to think of her as, you know, um, having the potential to be a writer. My mother very much, so very much has that sort of sensibility. So I, I feel like I grew up with parents who had potential to be artists in some way, um, but who never became artists. You know, so that was that's always been really interesting to me is that informal way in which I could see that my parents were were far more in that artistic creative realm than in you know um, the more sort of left brain. Um, and I had siblings, two, two, two brothers and a sister, and you know we pretty much ran around as a gang, uh, you know, around the neighborhood, and, and I went just to, to primary and high school in the neighborhood. Um, so yeah. So, so that kind of leads me to my next question: What kind of creativities did you grow up with? In your home? Um, so I. So reading was reading and music was 
was big. Um, cooking and baking was also big, and I, I, I you know, again, I have the advantage of um, time and perspective. So all of this is retroactive. I, I didn't sort of. Uh, have that level of analysis as to what was going on, but when I think about, you know, my formative years and what it has for me, um, uh, home craft. You know, my grandmother knitted all our jerseys and all our school uniform jerseys. You know, until we got to high school, and it was like that's not cool anymore. <laughs> you know? um, so that that sort of crafty. Um, you know, we had a beautiful garden. Um, I grew up with, uh, we had one of the tenants, so we also, I grew up in a situation where we had always had three tenants at any time, um, but long-term ten tenants, you know, people who lived with us for 20 years or so. One of them worked for the National Parks in Cape Town, and he would kind of smuggle plants from the mountain and throw them, you know, so I, grew, I, I remember the garden as being an extremely aesthetic and sensual and sensory place for me. Like I would spend hours just daydreaming in this garden, you know, it was just so beautiful. But also Cape Town, the landscape, really left a huge impression on me, you know. Going to Musenberg was something we did a lot, jumping on the train and going to Musenberg, Simonstown, Cork Bay. And, you know, you, you have water on the one side and you have the mountain on the other side and you have this incredible sky. So nature, it was very strong. It left a very strong impression on me. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't have time for those kinds of things. I don't have time for baking. I don't have time for cooking. I don't have time for gardening. I don't, but I love those things, you know. The, and I, I think of those things as my first creative and aesthetic and sensory experiences. Um, you know, in terms of art with the capital A, I would say that um, reproductions, you know, reproductions of artworks um, that we had in our own home and that my grandmother, who worked as a domestic worker for a family in Cape Town for 20 or 25 years, and, uh, you know, in, I remember in her bedroom there was a poster above her bed and I would you know, lay on her bed with my feet up on the pillows looking at this poster. And I just stay at this poster for hours trying to figure out what is this man doing, what is this horse all about, what, like, what's going on, and I would just come up with all kinds of questions. It was a poster of Napoleon on horseback <laughs> by David. I mean, it's like, you know, it's the, 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 not that, like, it's not the most exciting <laughs> art to discover, right? But this, this man on this horse fascinated me. And fast forward many years later, I, um, when I, I moved to the US to study and I got a job at an art institute, and the person who was my associate director was a David scholar. <laughs> and he, he specialized in French painting. And through him, I learned a lot about what that painting meant, finally, right, after all these years. And it was about history painting, and it was about power, and it was about nationalism, and it was about all those things. I mean, things that I had learned about, you know, through history, through philosophy, through English, but not necessarily through the visual or through art history. But suddenly it made perfect sense to me. Well, of course I'd be interested in this, you know. Um, I'm interested in history. and. Uh, and at the same time, I remember seeing um, at the Brooklyn Museum, they have this huge Andy Wiley painting of you know the African-American man on horseback that's modeled after that same David painting. Now, when I saw that, I just, I got it instantly, you know? So again, it's a series of just random connections, but also I, I really think that the landscape and, um, you know, my parents and seeing their, their creative sides more and then being in primary and high school where my teachers were really critical thinkers and just learning to, you know, uh, how to um, channel my curiosity, you know. So and which school did you, did you go to and did any of them have art? None of my schools had art. I, I remember that in primary school there was an art room. There was a huge room about this size, and there were lots of uh, tables, 
and it was called the art room and there was paper in there and some powdered paints that was about it but I knew I, I didn't know what, what goes on in that art room I don't know because you know it wasn't like there was a qualified art teacher per se you know it, was, it just seemed to be a box that you checked off if you were building a school oh there has to be an art room but the art room was you know I think People did homework in the art room or, you know, put music on and danced or like whatever, you know, anything, anything. I, I remember taking one art class which was with, the, you know, the potatoes that you make shapes and you put it in the paint and then you make the prints. It's called potato prints. Potato <laughs> prints. <laughs> that was the only art class I remember, but uh, this room was, you know, big, big windows. It was a beautiful room, but there, there wasn't any actual happening in that room. Um, in high school, uh, I went to youth field high, and um, there, were, there was no art department or art teacher or art room, actually. But there was, uh, you know, I mean, I found, I found English, for instance, to be very creative, you know, because you could read, because there was theatre, because, you know, we had, I had characters in our classroom where you didn't have to read out loud and people would get pretty dramatic with Shakespeare, you know, and, and in an effort to annoy the teacher by being the most obnoxious in your reading of Shakespeare, and she just loved it, in fact, so it, it totally backfired because the more over the top you, you, you know, read, the more she thought you were so into it and was enjoying it, so, so I remember those classes were just so great, you know, but no formal uh, art, no. So you are one of the, those kind of curators who have a somewhat unusual but rich scholarly history outside visual arts. You did a BA with majors in English, History and Philosophy, then a Diploma in Education, then an MA in History before pursuing a PhD in Art History. How did you find your way to the visual arts and curating in particular? Um, so, I mean, it's sort of in a roundabout way, but uh, it's really through photography. and. Um, during my masters uh, at UWC, um, one of our one of our my history professors was really interested in how historians are working with photographs, because historians were discovering lots of photographic archives, colonial photographic archives, and you know working with those in terms of writing social histories. And the way historians were working with photographs was, just to simplify it, um, looking at a photograph and saying, on the 5th of September, um, this woman, these two women, were sitting down in front of an audience and doing a talk. She was wearing white and gray, and the other one was wearing black and gray. And they were there on that day, like, that's it. <laughs> like just this very evidentiary kind of approach, you know, to say this happened on this day and here's the proof of it. And what what we, what my professor was interested in, what I became interested in, was how to problematize that, you know, because we knew it's problematic. A photograph is a representation; it's not a reality, and uh, yet we were treating it as if it was real, you know, as if there was no coercion, in, possibly outside of the frame or. I mean, because it's colonial archives, and you have to, you know, there's, you, you know that there's some level of coercion or, or, you know, power dynamics at play. And so we started to explore that through this visual history course. That's what we called it. And that was very interesting because photography, when you read, uh, when you try to understand photography, you can read philosophy, you can read sociology, anthropology, you can read art history. Uh, gender studies. So photography allows you to enter a lot, uh, a lot of, you can, you can read theoretically to try to understand it, you can take a lot of different approaches. Um, and that was exciting to me, you know, that I could cross disciplines uh, in trying to understand this image and how the image works. So um, I ended up quite accidentally in an art history PhD. 
um, because... How does one end up accidentally in an <laughs> Because I was interested in photography. And, you know, my thesis for my master's was around um, uh, documentary photography in Cape Town in the 1950s as, you know, a way in which families were showing their modernity and all of that stuff. I was very much into that at the time. And so I, you know, I applied to work with a professor who uh, is a, an expert in social documentary photography. That's what everyone sort of advised me to do, is find the person you want to work with and then apply at that school, which is what I did. So anyway, first day of class, I realized, okay, I mean, I realized in a more, uh, in, you know, embodied physical way, of course, I, when I made my application, I knew it was an art history department. I didn't even think about what that means or what about, you know, I was going to go and do a South African documentary photography project, was what I was thinking. And so, you know, on the first day of class, I'm surrounded by 10 other students who all have done masters in art history and, you know, who were talking about art and artists. And so uh, I, I was very fortunate because everyone was from somewhere else. So I had a very good Brazilian friend who taught me a lot about Brazilian art history, um, someone from China, someone from India, someone from Turkey, um, and so on. I think we had one American actually in the group. And I thought, well, what do I know about art history? Because everyone was asking me, so tell us about South Africa, you know, tell us about the artists in South Africa and the history of art in South Africa. And um, I thought, oh shit, like, I mean, I can tell you about the history of South Africa, but the art history of South Africa. And so, you know, I, uh, I said, okay, well, um, I'm gonna have to find this out very quickly. I had, you know, Again, I, when I was in graduate school here in, in Cape Town, I did work with uh, an artist, Andrew Pater. I don't know if any, any of you know him. Andrew Pater is an artist from Cape Town. And he was looking for a research assistant. And uh, so as a graduate in history department, you know, I did, did, did a research project with him which resulted in an artwork installation in the waterfront. That was the first time I worked with a living artist, but I promise you I was very academic about it. I was the researcher, and you, like, I stayed in my lane. He, you know, he kept sort of trying to put me in, and, you know, as artists, artists like to involve you in everything, but I was like, but I'm the researcher, I don't know anything about art, you know. And, I know my maps and my history and my dates and, you know, and I, I gave, provided all the research for him to create the artwork. The artwork that he made, at, you know, after this process was such a distillation of all that research and was really just a very simple poetic intervention. It just blew my mind, you know. I was like, how could we go from here, all of this meat, to this extraction? Uh, symbolic extraction, you know? And so I had had that experience, but again, as I said, I was still very much with the blinkers on. I'm an academic, I'm a scholar, I'm into a PhD, you know? Um, and so when I um, had this sort of moment of, you know, what, I mean, what, what am I gonna do now? Let me go and find out about South African art. I then did an independent study, which you can do with one of your professors instead of signing up for a course. I said, you know, I'd like to learn about the history of art in South Africa, and will you do this independent study with me? And so in that process, you put together a bibliography, and you basically just read everything that you used to read. And the US is like the best place to learn about South African art, because all the books that I needed was there. Uh, you know, really um, archival documents are there, uh, really good uh, documentation of very early exhibitions, uh, artist monographs, I and mean, everything. And if it, if it wasn't there, I could certainly borrow it from, especially the Smithsonian libraries, you know. So I just spent an entire semester reading about uh, art from uh, the beginning, from the 1930s right up to the present. And that, so that was the early 2000s, and there were a lot of exhibitions of South African art in the US, also in the 2000s, end of the 90s, 2000s. And I was also going to, you know, see exhibitions and read catalogs, and, and I always, you know, I'd always, I'd always kind of sort of feel like, 
even though there were these exhibitions, um, because the country was opening up and people were interested in South African art, etc. You know, you know that feeling when you see something that is supposed to be about you, but you're not quite sure that it is, or you still have questions, or there's still some gaps, so you think, well, why did they include this artist, or you know, why not that artist, or how how do how do how does this audience understand the new South Africa? How does this audience understand South African art, etc.? So that combination of also just seeing and um, you know having questions uh, alongside the reading is, I think, what landed me then firmly within the history of art. You know, and so I changed my dissertation topic actually from the one looking at photography to. Um, uh, looking at when this moment happens, when South African art uh, becomes, you know, visible to um, Western audiences, let's say, and that's in, the, in, in, not, in, you know, not with the Johannesburg Biennales, and so that became the focus of my research. Um, but I, I will say that, you know, that moment of also realizing, well, you know, I don't know much about this was also a moment of uh, realizing that, you know, the reason I don't know about this is because this wasn't actually part of my education, you know, and this wasn't part of lots of South black South Africans' education. And uh, the challenges that black artists or curators or art historians had, or scholars or anyone even interested in art had to face, had to overcome, you know. And so it was, oh, it wasn't just because I don't know about art, it's because, you know, that was legally sanctioned for me not to know about art. Uh, it was, you know, this um, part of this colonial and apartheid mindset, you know, uh, that art is uh, something that only belongs to certain people or, you know, uh, art, art is only worthy of certain audiences, etc. You know? So uh, it had that sort of double, you know, it was, it was really great and fun and interesting for me to read about all this. And even as I'm reading about it, all the history, it, and, it, and it's very painful to read early South African art history, especially criticism, because you think criticism is scathing now? Back then, there were no holds barred. People were racist, they were anti-Semitic, they were sexist. I mean, they just said whatever they wanted to say, you know? So it was really, t it's tough to read that kind of stuff because you see how the ideology and the politics is woven into the language and of the text, you know? Can I ask you, Tash, because in 1999, you wrote a review on Emile Maurice's curated exhibition, Lives of Color, which is part of the photographic exhibition, Lines of Sight, shown at Sang from July to October 1999. And uh, it was convened by, uh, the was convened by Michael Garvey and Patricia Davidson at UCT. And discuss in detail the politics of representation and the identity of colored people in South Africa. So, I mean, you're like an undergrad at this time, and that's kind of pretty ballsy for an <laughs> undergraduate, right, back in those days and not even one in the field okay. to go and write a review uh, in that way. So kind of what, oh, what, 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 what gave you the confidence to voice yourself even at such a strong age? I mean, you know, what gave me confidence is always being um, school. You know, I, I, I really think that in the, bro in the broader scheme of things, you know, when everything around you uh, is, is almost uh, designed to undermine you, what really made me feel confident was school. You know, I, was, I, I felt lucky that I had teachers who cared. Um, teachers who were activists, teachers who were critical thinkers, and where, you know, you could speak your mind. You could, you, you were expected to speak your mind, you were expected to be articulate, you were expected to argue, you were expected to engage in debate. That was, my entire high school was like that. If you couldn't stand up and articulate 
what you're thinking, why you think that, and what your recommendation is, then you should just sit down and shut up, you know? So, so continued into the University of the Western yeah, Cape? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because it come, this was between 1995 and 1999. Yeah, and, and that's when I UWC started. had like a huge reputation for its political yeah. nature, right? Absolutely. And, and you know, the, I never let go of, I, I mean, I took a triple major for my BA because I loved history, English, and you know, philosophy, I, I, I was the add-on at university. I didn't have that at high school. But it were, for me, those, you know, I, I always had these really great teachers in those subjects, and I really couldn't let go of either and choose two majors. And once I started in philosophy, like that sort of grabbed me too. Um, but I would say, you know, there was like this fearlessness that they encouraged, like an intellectual fearlessness, you know. Um, and that was matched by also being able to uh, understand that you had choices and that you had agency and that, you know. And so it was the whole environment. School was for me a very empowering environment. Uh, I know it wasn't for everybody, even in my, of, of my peers or generations, but for me it was. Whereas everything else around me seemed pretty much to be like kind of falling apart, you know and disintegrating or in, a, in upheaval. Um, in the 90s at UWC, there were still marches and protests um, and students demanding, you know, um, for, free, for free, free education. Um, and police were still coming onto the campus and, you know, shooting rubber bullets at students for protesting at a time where, you know, everybody was being told, you know, this is, we're trying to negotiate. Uh, uh, the new South Africa year, and so, you know, everybody was being asked to be pulled into line. But I think that's where I got my confidence from, and um, I didn't feel at the time that I was doing anything daring or scared enough that I was cavalier about it. Writing is always hard, thinking is always hard, and I've always struggled with that. It's very painful. But I felt at least that, you know, I was, I think that that I was, it was a welcome space. I was welcome to give my opinion, to engage in debate, to think critically. So that on the one hand gave me a lot of confidence and on the other hand, I also feel like, you know, my parents loved me very much. You know, I, I grew up knowing that my parents really loved me even though, you know, um, we grew up very lower working class. You know, they, it, it wasn't like they, uh, showered me with gifts or we had fancy holidays or whatever but um it just in the everyday little ways you know that a, a kid can feel loved so i i, I feel like you know i always felt loved and and say and i could also speak my mind at home you know my dad encouraged that my, i think my dad got a little kick out of me telling him exactly what i thought you know so he was always kind of egging me on to do that um so yeah i, I think those are the you know, the sort of two ways in which I think I, I just did things. And I was always the kind of person who, no matter how, I, I, I sometimes I think today, I'm still like that, no matter how much something scares me or frightens me, or no matter how many doubts I have about anything that I'm doing, I do it anyway just to like prove to myself, you know, uh, just to overcome that fear or just to assuage it or shut it up. I'm like, I'm just, well, I'm just gonna do it anyway. Uh, but I always also recognize that there's, there's all, a good dose of that that goes with everything, you know? And then I just have to say, okay, well, I'm just going to do it all anyway. What was the first exhibition you curated? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I, you know, I wish I had images to show you of the first exhibition I curated because it was such a disaster that it's like a blank in my mind. <laughs> but it's the exhibition that I probably learned the most from. <laughs> um, in fact, all, all the failed exhibitions I probably, you know, failed in inverted commas learned the most from. Uh, and, you know, the exhibitions that I'll show you some of the recent stuff, uh, and you'll see it, you know, it looks amazing and it was incredible and we had great budgets and it's like the pinnacle at this point, right? But uh, there are also challenges that go with that, and it's of a different order. But my first exhibition, 
I was, you know, so here I am reading about art, going to exhibitions, discovering this whole new world, and I meet somebody, and this kind of thing happens in New York City regularly. I'm in Chelsea at White Box Gallery, and the director of the gallery, uh, Juan Puntes, says he's kind of a, you know, very um, uh, flamboyant and eccentric kind of guy. He did a show, um, I think it was actually called Displacement, Replace, dislocation, displacement, something like that. He did it with Kendall Pierce in the 1990s at his space. So when he heard I was South African, he said, oh, you should come do a show for me. I did the show years ago. You should definitely do a show here. And I thought, oh my god, like, you know, it's White Box, it's Chelsea. And I was like, of course, I'll do a show. I never could have did a show in my life. I had tons of ideas and, and whatnot. And, you know, off I went, oh, I'm going to get at the show. And the minute I said that, and as soon as I started, and then I thought, okay, well, how am I gonna, like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna pay for this? Um, what, like, where do I begin to, like, I really, I was as green as the grass outside. And um, I learned from that, always ask, always say, oh, that would be wonderful, what's the budget for that? <laughs> That I learned that lesson from after that show. I was like, always ask. It's like be polite and nice and show you're really interested and that would be amazing. But always ask what the budget is because that 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 helps you to figure out what you can do. So you don't over promise or under deliver, you know. But you can then pitch your idea just the right level, you know. Um, but. You know, and everybody was like, oh, you should go and see the open studios. All the artists are in open studios at the university. Go check it out. And of course, I went to see the open studios. And I didn't see any, any, anyone that like spoke to me or that I wanted to do something with. And somebody said, oh, but you should you know, check out this artist. He's like the next amazing artist. He's incredible. He's a performance artist, blah, blah, blah. Said, OK, fine, I'll do something with him. Another friend uh, who worked with me, I was also at this part-time job at a gallery, and she was a French girl who was a painter, and I just adored her, and I said, well, she has to be in my show. I'd never seen any of her paintings. I was just in love with her. She was just this really beautiful French girl who was my best friend, and I was like, you have to be in my show. And the third of this three artist show, and the third person, I can't even remember who the third person was, okay? So, Lou says, I'm going to make a whole set of paintings for you about the war in Iraq and the US, because we always had this political conversation. I thought, that's great. And have paintings about the war in Iraq. And the artist who was, um, he was a Chinese artist, said, I'm going to do this performance. And, you know, as part of the performance, I'm going to slaughter this chicken to show the spilling of blood. And I was like, yes, the spilling of blood. <laughs> the show is coming together. I was running around in Harlem getting a chicken, a live chicken. Where can I find a live chicken? We, we found these two live chickens. We took it to the gallery. Juan said, where are you going with those chickens? We said, it's for the performance. What, what, what are you going to do with the chickens? Oh, we're gonna, he's going to do this thing inside the gallery, go out on the sidewalk, slaughter the chicken, cut the chickens in. He said, not in my gallery. <laughs> do you have a permit for slaughtering chickens in the streets of New York City? Uh, no. Well, do you want the anti-cruelty people to be breathing down my neck? Sorry, cut the chicken. <laughs> the artist is furious at me because, you know, I'm supposed to be making this happen. And I, like, I, you know, I mean, I broke out. I, 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 even as an adolescent, I really never had, like, acne or zits. I had a huge zit on my nose, one on my chin. I was so stressed out. So the chicken isn't happening. <laughs> Lou, Lou decides she wants her paintings to kind of go on a pulley, like, around here. The windows, so people through the windows can see the paintings moving. Okay, fine, but at least with Lou, her mom and her dad was paying for everything, so it was like, fine, you do that, okay? <laughs> she kind of brings the paintings into the gallery, and they are these awful paintings. <laughs> she makes sand from the beach where she lives with pig, red pig. I mean, I was not an expert about anything, 
and I thought they were bad. <laughs> and so she has these huge paintings and this pulley system has been constructed and the paintings are going down and the other artist isn't basically not talking to me, I don't know what he's going to do. In the end, the performance is a ladder with some rope and beer drinking, I don't know. <laughs> it was a disaster. On every single level, it was a disaster. But, you know, I learned so much from that. I, and I, I, it was so bad that I thought, this is not for me. Oh my gosh. I, 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 could, I can't be a curator. So, a few years later, you know, after the trauma had sort of calmed down a bit, an artist friend of mine moved in, up to Massachusetts and where I was working and living at the time. And he said, oh, I've moved up here and I bought this building and people are really expecting me to do something because I'm an artist and there's not an, there's not an art gallery, there's not an art um, museum. It's just the university uh, college, um, community college. And it's like a really sort of mix, like one of those regional, small regional cities in um, the US where, you know, they, they emerge during a kind of boom time and then they kind of go, go down and so there were lots of abandoned buildings in the main street and buildings that were closed that people hadn't seen and I thought, oh, why would I, I said, I said, well, you know, I'm not really a curator, I mean, I'm starting to be an art historian, you know, like I'm going to stick to the books and the writing, you know. And then we, you know, drank a lot and we said, okay, we're going to do something, you know, let's do something. But I did give it more thought and there was less pressure because I didn't feel this expectation like I'm in Chelsea and I'm in the art world and I have to do something amazing, you know. So there was no none of that pressure. And this time I had learned something. So, you know, we said, okay, what, what could we do? What could, what fun we did have to do some fundraising. Um, what would work? I thought a lot about that. I thought, well, you know, what could work in this town? Because it became more important that people have an experience of art, not that we do an exhibition, you know? And so we came up with the idea of doing a video art festival. And I thought that video art could be really cool in these different spaces because at least, like with photography, we have access to video because it's a screen. Um, and, you know, and then I had a better sense working with him, again, working with an artist, I also learned a lot, you know, because then, um, getting to know artists that he knew, you know, and getting to, then, by then I had enough of a little network that I could actually go and visit and say, you know, and so I looked at a lot of artists and some amazing things happened in that process because it was more like a festival that involved the whole town, it involved lots of people, but, you know, there was like a really important artist who, who lived in that neighborhood, heard about the festival and offered to, uh, for us to show one of these projections in the festival, which was like, oh my god, it's like a blue chip artist, you know? And he sent in his whole team and they installed the whole projection. And he, just because he liked that we were doing something in town, you know? So there was a whole sort of mixture of that. Um, Deneo Bopapi was just finishing at Columbia University and she was making a lot of video art at that time, it was 2009. And so, you know, I invited her, I showed some of her videos as well. And, uh, you know, we were, we were still doing a lot of DIY things, like bottling TV screens and bottling, you know, players and whatnot. But um, everything came together and, you know, it was from 4 on a Friday afternoon until Sunday night. And uh, once the sun goes down, and it was just like, that's actually when I really felt, okay, I can do this. Because once the, light, the sun went down and all the video art came on and people came out in the streets and were with their kids and looking through windows and going into buildings and we had tons of volunteers, it was like this whole vibe, you know? But it was like, to me, I stepped out and I mean, we were lit I was literally still patching something or doing whatever and they said, everything has to stop now. It's open. Whatever's not done is not done, but we have to be out there, you know? I think actually I even showed a video of Sue Williamson. And again, that, that festival became more meaningful for me because I then started to draw in artists that I really think make sense in that um, context. 
And what was very important in that community, there was, there was a lot of problems with drugs, there was a lot of issues around, there was a protest every Friday, a vigil against the war that the US was waging in Iraq, for instance, you know? Um, and so trying to also kind of match make, you know, what, what work would really resonate with people as well as be interesting, and what would be just funny and fun and cool, you know, to see. Um, and so that was like a huge success, and I walked out and I really felt like it was a symphony, you know, like we were making music, and it was because people were having an experience and, and saying to me like, but you know, you're not even from here, why are you doing this? Why would you, why would you do all this work, like create this for us, you know? And um, I thought, well, hmm, if I could do that here, then I can do that in South Africa too, I guess. <laughs> you know? So it was like a little bit of a testing ground too. But that's when it became the, the possibility that this could be something that I do, that um, I could bring my passion for art, for you know, research and scholarship, and for working with artists, I could bring it all together. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your, your, your curatorial process. And how you proceed? It's very intuitive, you know. I'm not. I mean, if if I'm asked for a proposal or to send in a proposal for a show, I can take some time and think about, you know, what that would be. And even when I'm writing a proposal, I start with the artist first, like the artists that I'm interested in, the artists that I think um, are making really exciting work, the, the ideas that's that's there. I'll start with that. And, and, and once I sort of know, okay, well, yeah, I see some connections between these four or five artists or, you know, then I'll start to think about, it's almost like I'll remove myself one level and think about, okay, how do I describe all of this, what's going on here, you know, and if it's about, let's say, it's about violence. So then that theme will emerge to me, you know, this is really where they intersect. And sometimes that's how I also learn what is of interest to me. You know, um, and then I'll put a slideshow together and I'll uh, contextualize it and you know add add whatever needs to be added in the proposal. So that's that sort of way of working. Um, if I'm we're just having a conversation and you say, well, you know, I have the space and uh, would you like to create a show for for us? And I'll say, yeah, uh, you know, this is what I'm really interested in. I like doing shows of women artists. I like doing shows with. Uh, artists of color and I like doing political shows, you know? And so if we have that mutual interest, then it's like, yeah, okay, let's begin that conversation. And it really is a conversation. Um, the other important lesson I learned about curating is that everything is a negotiation. Even when you think, this is my show, this is the title, these are the artists, this is the works. What the show will be, uh, will be its own thing because you would have gone through a whole set of negotiations. Maybe that work is not available, you know, so you have to select a different work. Maybe, you know, there's a limitation in the space, so you have to change something. So even though, you know, you can have a pretty strong idea of what you want to do and how you want it to look and feel, etc., uh, there's, there's a lot of negotiations that, that happen. But I like to approach it intuitively. I like to feel it out, you know, what, what, what could be relevant here, what could be interesting, what's been done before, what's coming next. Like, I, I like to kind of figure that stuff out, you know, what is the space like, how does it feel, what kind of experience do I want to create? And also, because I'm producing something too, I'm making something, you know, I'm making an exhibition. And what, what do I want to make? What do I want to, how do I want to use this material art to create the exhibition um, and the experience? And potentially what questions do I want to respond to or address? So, so that's something I find very fascinating about you is that you don't shy away from the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality, nationality. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of the art world that says, oh, we're very tired of that, and, and, and we're done with that. But you actually go for that stuff, and, and you do it very well. So <laughs> I want to ask you what some of your joys and frustrations are uh, in your position as a curator in general, 
but also when it comes to the kinds of other labels that are put on you, you know, African curator, curator of color, woman curator, when all of those are added and you're, and you're curating at the intersections of those, yeah. uh, what are some of the, what would you count as some joys and what some frustrations? I mean, I, I used to pay attention to that kind of stuff, but I don't pay so much attention anymore. I used to pay attention to uh, labels and categories, you know, Marxist, feminist, um, activist, etc. Uh, I, I don't so much any, anymore because, you know, I want to get at the heart of the thing, and the heart of the thing is about all these things, you know. So, in, in terms of, you know, when I start to feel that expectation to have, let's say, to, when I start to feel that expectation that I have to do exhibitions of black artists only when I'm in the US because I'm black and I'm from South Africa or Africa or whatever, then I start to get like, like, like chittery, you know, like I, I start to like, want, I like back, I get very nervous. I, I, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I, I, I can feel it. I can feel like my whole body starts to shake. And it's because it's being imposed on me, you know? It's like, that is what I'm about, but don't impose it on me, you know? It's like, that's what I do anyway. But I, I, I hate that feeling of imposition, you know? Because that makes me feel like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like I'm being put in a box or that what I do has to fit into a box. And so that stifles like the kind of creativity or you know questions or curiosity that I might want to bring to the show. So I, t I, I don't have a problem. The only category I never have a problem with is women. I, I, know, I know everybody's tired of like women artists shows, you know, like, Oh, not another art, not another show about women, not another, like, especially in this day and age where we have, you know, where that's exploded just in terms of uh, sexuality and the fluidity of that and the LGBTQ activism around that, it's like, wow, but why would you want to have another woman show, you know? Uh, that's one, that's one box that I don't mind, uh, one expectation that I don't mind because I really do understand on a deep level how unequal the playing field still is for women artists. So even though we had so we even though we have so many women artists now practicing and teaching and curating etc, um, that still doesn't translate uh, necessarily into, you know, um, recognition for that work or, you know, market success for their work or uh, even opportunities. So for me, I feel like I could probably do that for a, like a few more decades, and it'd still be the, the the hole is so big, you know. The uh, to to fill it up is 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 I think so such a huge job that I think that we should all be doing that as much as we can to fill up that hole because it's 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 big when you look at who the top. 20 artists are in the world, contemporary artists, there's maybe two women on that list. Um, and it's all white men, you know, predominantly. So I think, you know, that that's the only one that I don't react to because I really know how deep that is. I think black artists have had a lot of success, you know, I think even um, queer artists uh, are having a lot of success and more space is being opened up, has been opened up, and it's, you know, it's a very, um, uh, it's, it's very illuminating and it's very present, and I think that's what we do, is we make space, like, you know, I, I think uh, analytically how I think is always in that intersectional way, because I think that is how I learn to think, you know, critically. But um, in terms of what I do as a practice, as a curator in creating exhibitions, is always about making space in culture, making that space bigger and bigger and bigger, more inclusive, more diverse, etc. But even that can be violent. You know, there can even be violence when you enter a space that's not uh, necessarily welcoming of you or for you or you know, um, just maybe doing politics then that can also be a very challenging and difficult experience. 
And so I think that's probably my largest frustration, you know, is that even when you, when you do that kind of work, you also have to be aware that you're doing that work very often within a culture or mainstream situation or institution um, with, with that is not the norm, you know. So um, you could do an, an incredible exhibition of, you know, showing this intersectionality and diversity in the world, but within an institution that might do one of those exhibitions every 10 years, you know, every five years, or where the, the leadership and the staff uh, is, is still predominantly homogenous, you know, uh, one group, that it is only one group. So I think that's, that's still a challenge and a frustration is like, even when spaces open up, you still have to deal with, you know, with what that means. So, so Tash, I have like pages of questions here. <laughs> but you can, you can see Natasha is not exactly short on our words and yeah. everything is so interesting. <laughs> but I do want to highlight, I'm, I'm going to, I'm kind of finishing with some of the highlights that you can talk to in a few minutes, okay? okay. So you you worked you worked uh, at the Clark Institute for a number of years as the assistant director of the academic and research program. Um, you've also started you're co-founder of Assembly Room in New York. It's a gallery and an online platform that uh, seeks to raise a profile of women curate color uh, kind of women of color curators. Um, and part of, part of Assembly Room's uh, format is, is around, uh, around collaboration and around community that seems to be at the heart of, of, of a lot of things you do. And the other two things I want to mention so that you can kind of talk to them and we can finish, the finish uh, is you've, you've done a series of shows with the Ford Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was uh, Perilous Bodies which opened to 1,000 people in the opening night. Yeah. Okay, so for those of us who know what exhibitions are, 1,000 people in the opening night is a bit hectic. I don't even know how you follow it up with the next question. Uh, I mean, with the next exhibition. Uh, and then you've also, um, and then you had an another exhibition after that called Radical Love as well, which you've seen some of the images from with the red uh, walls really gorgeous exhibition around the idea, this idea of radical love, right? Yeah. And now you, you're here in Johannesburg and you, in 2015 you started the underlying show concept in Cape Town and then 2016 in Joburg, correct? And yeah, then, sorry, the, I, the, those dates got a little screwed up in, the, in that outline that I sent you, okay. but I'll, I'll fix it for you. <laughs> So this year you are relaunching Adeline the Museum of Art and Design here in Johannesburg. So if you can tell us a bit about your concept, your collaborators, and this 2019 iteration, and kind of speak to some of those highlights as well, if you like. In five yeah. minutes. Gosh. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, as, as I mentioned, one of my highlights was this disastrous first exhibition, right? And this show, the Radical Love show, is like the counterpoint to that, you know, and it just took like six years or so to get there. You know? So, um, and this show, why it's a counterpoint to that is because, of course, there was a great budget for the show. Um, the gallery itself is nestled within a foundation and an institution and an organization devoted, uh, dedicated to social justice. Um, and it's a huge grant-making organization that leads to creative expressions and, you know, other grant areas, several other grant areas as well. Um, and so it was a new opportunity for them to actually showcase, you know, what they do through the arts. The foundation is a big supporter of the arts as well. Um, and, you know, the invitation was to create these two shows. Um, the first one, just looking at the kind of state of the world, you know, looking at um, a kind of global picture. And what we focused on, again, intersectionality was important to myself and my co-curator. And what we focused on was violence, you know. So we took, we, we, we brought in artists who were dealing with gender-based violence, um, violence against the environment, um, violence in, in terms of the ongoing wars in the city in the Middle East, let's say, uh, and the US involvement in that. 
Um, and uh, you know, there was the historical violence as well. So we've sort of looked at it in different ways. Radical love was envisioned as a kind of antidote to a lot of that violence, to uh, a lot of the systemic inequalities, um, and really to otherness. Uh, and so the word radical was kind of recuperated from its association with you know, religious fundamentals, radical, um, to, to uh, and inspired by bow hooks as well, and the idea of revolutionary love that you can only have transformation through the Can, can we do a little side note here? Mm -hmm. So when you work for the Clark Institute, yes. uh, we tried to get Bell Hooks to come yes, to South Africa. Did. <laughs> it didn't work out because she just moved back home yeah. to take care of her ailing parents, actually. Yeah. Um, but you did get to talk to her. What was that yes. like? Um, I mean, she was just very sweet and said she'd love to come, but unfortunately she couldn't. As, and she, like, very humble, very sweet, very, you know, matter, like, kind of ordinary about it, you know. Um, but I think she had been to South Africa before, too, uh, in some capacity. Uh, I don't know, very public, in a very public way. So she was very excited to know that this was happening. And, you know, um, and, and just like very sweet about it. I remember just thinking her voice was very sweet. She was very kind, you know, in, in accepting. So she's been a figure, you know, uh, kind of who's, who's thinking and theorizing has been as important to us for a while and also to um, I calculate on the show. And so Radical Love also wanted to express just the joy and the excess and the, you know, um, and the beauty and the, the richness of um, our lives, you know, the richness of uh, the lives of people of color, the, the, the lives of um, queer people, the lives of um, you know, brown people, indigenous people as well in the U.S. So the show, as you can see, is just very opulent, very rich. It's a, it's a visual feast uh, because, um, you know, we and, and that color of the walls communicate this strong emotion, but we want, obviously, the artworks transcend that emotion to make statements, more political statements. And that show was also very well attended. It was not as overwhelming as the first exhibition, uh, where I was really, I was literally speechless. I mean, to see a thousand people show up for an opening and lines going around the block. Um, and it was such a mix of people, too. You know, it wasn't a typical art opening night in Chelsea or so. It's just kind of art world people. But it was such a range of people and very international as well. And, you know, I've met people in other uh, places after these shows open and, and the feedback that I always get and what really kind of blows my mind about these shows is that people felt that the gallery was a space for them, you know, and that the shows were for them. And I, I and you know, I thought, well, maybe it doesn't even matter, you know, like, they, they just, I was like, it, could we put anything in there? Just like, <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was just such an overwhelm. And, I mean, and of course, everybody had a favorite artwork or two or three that they liked. You know, So it was about the art as well. But um, you think in a city like New York City with so many museums, so many galleries, so much to offer, that people would actually feel um, welcomed in like, places were for them, but a lot of people still don't. A lot of people of color still don't feel like places are for them. And it's still very segregated, you know. You'll know when you're going to a studio museum in Harlem opening. So they don't have a building right now because they're building a new building. And they had an exhibition at MoMA PS1. Now, I go to MoMA PS1's openings or shows, it's a different audience. When Studio Museum had their show at PS1, completely different audience, you know? I was like, what's, wait, what's going on? Well, oh, yes, of course, the Studio Museum is here, so it was all their kind of followers, you know? And so it's, it, it, even there, um, people of color still feel some places are for them and some places aren't for them. And here, you know, so many others, right? Uh, international others, local others, really felt that this was for them. 
And it was, you know. And we, as curators, we were totally empowered to make a show like that. You know, we, we had complete and total uh, support in dedicating shows um, uh, to, to these subject matters and to these topics and to these artists. So that was really just an incredible high. And I'm still trying to process a lot of that too because it also came with its own challenges. Um, but that was my takeaway from those shows. What I take away from that, those shows is the, or the visitor and audience experience was just so incredible you know, and, and so heartfelt. And then, um, you know, I started this, um, art, it's, it's, an, it's a platform for curators, women curators, and it's an art gallery space <coughs> too. It's, you know, it's small, it's about sort of 300 square feet long, like this little rectangle on the Lower East Side with two other women curators. And that became important because we, we, we had these monthly dinners with women curators where we'd all kind of talk shop, you know, challenges, support each other, offer advice, share artists. And we said, well, let's make it like formal, let's do something, you know. And so it sort of came out of something we've been doing for a year. And it's so great to have a, a home in the city where we can do whatever we want and really support each other in doing that. Um, and you know, so that that has also put me in a community with other women cadets because I think that's important too. You you feel like you alone, you're the only person doing this, and then you realize, but you're not. You know? but, uh, but speak speak to the idea of space and what space yeah. means for a curator. So and access to space. Yeah, I mean, what? space is like um, it's like your key ingredient, you know. And space can be anything. I, I've seen shows in people's bedrooms, in their apartments, in the back of a, you know, a gardening shop. At the back of the shop is something. You know, it's about space is an ingredient in the sense that it's something you work with. You know, it's not like that we that you that you always. It, it, it's like your sixth. Uh, how many senses are we supposed to have five? So it's like the sixth sense. Space is, it's part, it becomes part of your senses, as you, you know, your eyes, your uh, mind, your uh, space. So it, it's really important. And you know, the difference in scale, so our space is 300 square feet. It's like a shoebox. This space is 2,000 square feet. So this is also like a shoebox, but a very big shoebox, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and very high ceilings, 20 foot high ceilings. And I thought, man, like how am I ever going to get ready to small space again? Because it literally translates in terms of what you can achieve, you know? And, and of course, it's not just the space. We had a, a budget to match that 2,000 square foot space. We have 300 square foot space. We have a budget to match that space. But what it gives you an indication of is that you can enter at any level, you know. I think that's the thing that I learned is that if you are in Johannesburg, if you are in New York City, you are part of an arts community here. You might not think you are, you might not feel like you are, you might feel like an outsider, or whatever, but you are part of it. And you have to figure out how you want to be a part of it. You, you have to decide, how do I want to be a part of this community? And then figure it out and go about doing it that way. So for us, that was our way to figure out how can we be a part of this community at assembly room. How can we be a part of the New York art world? But uh, you know, embrace the things we like about it and forget about the things we don't like about it. You know, we we, we don't care about the things we don't like about it. We embrace what we do like about it. And so that's what we promote. That those are our values. What we like about it. How we want to participate and on our own terms. Um, and I think that's important, and so that has also inspired the Underline show, which I hope you all come to because it's opening next week at Moed. And the Underline show is also based on this idea that you know you you create success by coming together and doing something together. You know, not expecting one person to do it or you know to be given to you, etc. But that this idea that. Um, you know, a new partner. I mean, everything we've done has been through in-kind collaboration. So Moad, you know, uh, is an in-kind um, uh, supporter of 
the underlying show because the University of Johannesburg has the lease and they haven't been doing anything with it. And they said, sure, you can have it for two weeks. You know, whereas if we had to rent a space for two weeks to do a show, it would be 25,000 rand or more, you know. So again, that is a huge, we, we can take that 25,000, put it aside, uh, but we get the space, right, which we not paying for, but it has that value. And of course it has a greater value because we are able to bring in, we'll have 12 curators, we'll have you know, 12 small shows, um, and we'll have performances um, through a collaboration with the Bag Factory, we'll have site-specific installations through collaborations with artists, and it's really this model of like, do it yourself, you know, um, DIY. It's, I hope that it feels like a festival and not like, oh, it's just another white cube, art fair, art model space. All the art's for sale. But, you know, if the art sells, everybody wins. If nothing sells, nobody wins, you know? So there's also a kind of different model in that. The curator gets paid, artists get paid, we get paid. Everybody gets something. But over and above that, what, what I, the third thing I want to say also that I guess is most important out of my trajectory is that things happen more than and over and above um, sales of artwork, you know. Artists get opportunities. Um, we have Devil's Peak Brewery who um, has awarded, we had a competition, and one of the artists in the show won the competition to have their artwork printed on a beer can for a special edition of 500, you know, of these local beers, but the artist gets 15% of the sales of that 500, and that's incredible. You can pay for the studio, you can pay for supplies, you can do a lot with that. But that came about too through just a conversation and us, you know, us saying, well, let's be open to the beer competition. Because as we all know in the arts, it's not like we think, oh, well, there are other ways, you know, which could be more prestigious. But in fact, it was like also a learning process of being open and having a conversation with them and, and, and uh, using it as a learning moment, a teaching moment to say to them, hey, you know, it's really great to have your artwork on, your, on this amazing uh, edition can, but artists also really need to be paid for their artwork and supported to pay for their studios and their production so they can keep making art. And they went like, yeah, of course, that makes total sense. Sure, how can we work that out, you know? So, I mean, it's the hope that when you all come together and we all bring your networks together and everybody pulls things, uh, resources and contacts and networks, that something comes out of that. Maybe it's museum shows, maybe a gallery, one of the galleries sees an artist that they like, or maybe a curator gets invited to do a different show. So for us, it's about more than you know the show and whatever opportunity uh, um, come directly from the show, but this greater visibility, you know, and and it's so much more constructive than sitting sitting around complaining about how few opportunities there are for curators in South Africa, you know. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to also punt for volunteers after what oh. you said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you understand all the challenges of the curator. Um, we would love to have any volunteers. Uh, we would love to help out in all kinds of ways during the show. Um, you could just email us at in info at underlineprojects.art. Info at. And, you know, it's totally volunteer. Um, we are willing to pay uh, for a few days, uh, however that works out with whoever's schedule is interested, 200 grand a day. But again, we can only maybe take three or four people. So, you know, unfortunately, I would love to have like 12 people, but we realistically can probably only take three or four people. Okay. But, um, Last question, Nash, because we're running out of time. But, um, as a visual artist, uh, I, I can't always say that curators are my favorite people. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had some really shitty experiences with curators and the kind of the whole shift to the power politics where the curator is a central figure, I think, you know, it swung one way too far at a certain point and I think we, 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 we tried, I think now we try to still get that back. But um, I've worked with you for a number of years and I've worked with, say, Mkulia Mabaso for a number of years 
and the two of you are some of the most amazing curators, and I, and I really mean in terms of coolness, but you're incredibly generous, respectful, you really care about every art exhibition <coughs> who you encounter. You're also very tough when you need to be, uh, but you're also genuinely nice without ego. And so my last question to you is, <laughs> How have okay. you managed to stay this way? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure there are a number of artists out there who probably, uh, you know, think can put put me in the in the in the uh, department of you know worst curators to ever work with, namely <laughs> Chinese artists I previously <laughs> referred to whose performance I was not able to pull off. Um, but you know, I mean it's. I feel, and I don't know, maybe it's because I was in, you know, I always thought I'd be a teacher, really, you know, at university, a professor and teach, and I, I always enjoyed learning and being with, with students and that relationship, you know, and I think in that relationship, uh, there is a kind of caring, you know, you, you have to care for, you have to be critical, you have to guide, they, they are all those things. Um, but I also think of artists as my fellow collaborators, you know, and that it is a collaboration, um, and the, at least the best kinds, when it works out, it is because it is a collaboration, because I can say, hey, Charlene, do you mind if we show this on a TV monitor because I won't be able to project this, you know, and, it, and you say, well, let's take a look and let's see what, how that would change this installation. I, I think, that, that's the best kind is when you can have that collaboration around um, you know what what uh, that installation or that show will be and I learn a lot I have learned a lot from artists too um, so uh, you know for me and that's ongoing I'm, I, I learn something from you know all different kinds of artists that I work with all the time because artists are always evolving. But I also feel like my practice sometimes feels like a creative practice, the way art making is a creative practice, and I try to be creative in how I approach exhibitions. So I think that keeps me open, you know, to anything can happen, and I always think something amazing will happen, etc. And, you know, the, the stresses and the challenges are kind of par for the course, you know. I, I realized even if I was in a, in a I could say academia, as a professor, I would still have stresses and challenges, and, you know, I still want to like pull my hair out, mm -hmm. etc. So, you know, being an artist, being a creator, being like, whatever you choose, like, there are always going to be these stresses and you just have to find a way to deal with them, you know, and I think the most destructive thing is when you shut down and you close down and you don't, you don't want to deal with anything, you know, you'd rather just kind of write something or, or write someone off and not. Um, I think it's more constructive to just come, keep talking, you'll get there, you'll get to a point of resolution, you'll get to a point where you both feel good about something, you'll get to that point that you just have to be, you, just, you have to want to get to that point and you have to keep the dialogue open. Um, but I also try to just like also be grounded, you know, um, about who I am and what I do and what I can do and what I can't and I mean I felt like I said, I was totally overwhelmed by the reception of these exhibitions, and it felt really amazing, you know. And and I mean, I was like floating, you know, on air that night, and I really felt amazing. But you know, the next morning I woke up, and like I had like a million worries in my mind again, you know. So it's like it was already the next, like the next show, the next thing, the next concern the next set of issues so I think but I try I do try to stay grounded I still clean the bathroom and do laundry and walk the dog and you know like I try to do things like talk to my family and that will keep me from you know maybe having too 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 big of a of an ego um, so so Tash the next segment is a quick fire Oh my god. <laughs> Tash, when is the audience going to ask me some questions? <laughs> as, as, as fast as you get to answer these okay, questions. Okay, okay, okay. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay, Do so, it. Do it. so you know
What delights me instantaneously? Food. What's your pet peeve, generally? People who did over my shoulder. <laughs> What's your least favorite color? Um, orange. Do you have a favorite book or writer? Or if you were a literary character, who would you be? Oh my god, that's like the hardest question to somebody who loves books and to read. I, I would be Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> who is your favorite artist? Oh my god. Quick, Natasha. <laughs> Vanessa German right now. Okay. Who is your heroine? Um, all our kind of radical ancestors, like women intellectuals, like, I mean, Tony Morrison, who died recently, made me think again about, you know, Desiree Lewis is somebody who, since I was at grad school, I followed and admired, so women like that, women intellectuals. If you could wish any artwork into your life, which one would it be? If I could wish any artwork into my life, which one would it be? Right now, Titus Kaffar. Which artist, artwork, or art movement do you dislike? <laughs> <laughs> you know, for someone who likes to focus on the positive, that is an incredibly difficult question. Um, artists, art movement, or artwork, or artwork that I really don't like. Oh. See, see, see which part they don't get about the quick fire questions? Oh, yeah. They really think these characters and artists are so difficult. No, but you know, I was recently asked, actually I, 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 I was interviewing for this job and the guy asked me, what is one show that you really loved and one show that you really hated? I could only tell him one show that I really loved. I really, I, and I thought for three days after that, I still kept trying to think of one show I really hated. <laughs> but I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy target. I feel bad about saying which show I didn't like recently because it's an easy target. The Whitney by Anna was always criticized. Um, and there, was, there, was, there were things that I liked and things that I didn't like. And then that's big fire. What kind of songs get you going? 90s. Like dance music. Okay, your favorite word? Sex. <laughs> your least favorite word? Articulate. What turns you on? Uh, dancing. <laughs> what turns you off? Bad dancing. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you laugh? Jokes. I love hearing jokes. <laughs> what can I love comedies? What's your best virtue? Hard working. What is your idea of misery? Misery. Cooking. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Sound or noise do I love? Uh, water. The sound of water. What sound or noise do you hate? Um, you know that beep, beep, beep sound that a truck makes when it's backing up? <laughs> Especially when it's like 5 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> what is your favorite swear word? Fuck. Yes. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, artist. I, w I would attempt being an artist, but maybe that's too close. Um, other than artist, I would probably be like a botanist. Okay. What profession would you least like to do? Accountant. <laughs> Okay, quickly now. How would you like to die? Peacefully. <laughs> if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the party gates? Welcome. <laughs> okay. Natasha, I'm going to set this microphone around and we have just a few minutes for questions. Oh my god, you guys are so fire. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you so much um, for that presentation. Well, it's not a presentation, it's more like speaking through and thinking through your work. But um, it's funny, I was thinking of the word activism. Um, 
And I was thinking of activism as you were speaking, but as you were talking about opening up spaces and creating spaces, and the way in which people, certain people feel as though they do not belong, or you know, the internal, internalized rather, mm -hmm. borders mm -hmm. that, <coughs> that get created by so-called culture, mm -hmm. um, high mm -hmm. culture versus popular culture, yeah. or, you know, so, yes. So yeah. in relation to that, I'll just need for yeah. you to think through what you, how you, yeah, how you would be an right. activist. Well, right, the, I mean, it's, in, it's not just internalized, like, we don't just internalize where we belong and where we don't, or where we made to feel we belong and where we are made to feel we don't belong, but it is also external, right? So it is, in, it is a real thing, it's not something we kind of just imagine. Um, but I feel that, you know, Coming from South Africa too, it was I had this roundabout way to art, and maybe I was lucky that I did, so that I didn't go straight through art and experience that even more intensely. So my experience of being on the outside had to do with being on the outside of you know uh, society in general, right? And growing up as a, a, a you know coloured in a southern suburb of Cape Town. Uh, you really are in this kind of place of alterity because you know your heritage for 400 years is African, Asian, and European, but you can't even trace your second generation. That's how uh, deeply mixed you are, and how deeply you know uh, violent that has been. Right. So I, I think that you know you 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 come out of whatever you come out of and you see, you know, how things work in the real world, but then you have to make a choice, you know. Uh, and for me, it was this choice of, well, you know, uh, I am a part of this by virtue of the fact that I love art, that, uh, you know, scholarship is a passion, art is a passion, and art, working with art is a, but by virtue of that alone, you know, that, that is all I need. Speaking of, you know, the conference and the title for the conference, uh, of, uh, I was, um, this quote was really gripping, you know, to act from the epicenter of, you know, of, your, of yourself, of where you come from, uh, means that you, you, have to, you have to always overcome that and see yourself as already belonging, you're already there. You know, you, we were always already there, right? Um, and and what what you would do? What what would you do? So you are there. What what? So what would you do if you didn't have to think? You have to justify, explain, fight, argue, defend. What would you do? You know, and then just do that. Um, and so, I, but I mean, it takes you know time. It's an arc. Everybody's on their own journey. But I feel like as soon as I start feeling that, like feeling of maybe I'm an outsider or I don't belong, then I have to remind myself, but wait a minute, I do, like, you know, this, this is my world and I have to, it's, you know, I have to stake my claim and, and walk confidently in that world because, you know, I taught myself how to be a curator. I didn't go to curatorial school. And I, you know, I, I segued into curating because I ran out of time and money to finish my PhD. So it became a really pragmatic decision. But I already had that foundation uh, within the history of art. So when I became a curator, it was about learning the practice, the behind the scenes stuff that nobody tells you about. Because I was full of ideas, you know, and full of admiration for so many artists. But how do I put that all together into this experience that I want? Uh, to create for myself and for others. Um, so I think if that translates to a, a kind of activism, then maybe it's an activism of the self too, you know, and act, act, activating for yourself um, as a way out of that situation, you know. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions. Hi, Natasha, thank you so much for all the conversation. It's giving me um, insights into your own world, thinking of a life from a distance. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really impressed by the new program at the Man Show. I'm quite curious about how the kind of model that you're using to frame it and how.
how it sits in relation to the art fairs um, with galleries. And I'm, I'm curious whether this means we are in the mood of the curator. Do you mystify the galleries? And I wanted to find out what that means in your program. Uh, thank you for your question. So, um, so the underlying show is this idea of like this dual idea, right? It's a curatorial platform, so we want to work with curators who will realize shows on the platform. Um, and at the same time, um, it, it, it borrows a little bit from the art fair model in that all the artworks are for sale. And the way it's different from the art fair model, though, is that the curators are in pain for space, right? For booth space, like a gallery would pay uh, apply to an art fair and pay for their space. Um, a gallery's relationship with the artist is, you know, 50-50 or 60-40 or whatever it is in terms of the gallery represents the artist and uh, works to promote the artist and their work, uh, whether that's to institutions or to collectors or whatever, and they have an agreement with that. Um, what underline, you know, the show and it's the curators who are promoting the artists and the artworks. And in terms of how we break down our commission structure, um, we are we very really transparent about that. The artist will always get 50%. The curator, uh, it, the other 50% is shared between underline and the curator. So the curator gets 20% and underline gets 30. That is only if there is a sale. If nobody buys anything, nobody gets anything. You know, so that sort of means we're all in it together. Like everybody wins or nobody wins financially. On the other hand, because it's curated, we want to emphasize the ideas that the curators have, the artists that they are bringing, and how they are introduced. A lot of the um, the curators and the shows in this year's underline are young artists, artists who are not represented by galleries, and young curators who are not working in museums or galleries or project spaces or whatever. So they really are framing and contextualizing and introducing uh, these artists to you know the art world, to the general public, to students, to everybody. And I think you know that that is the work of a curator. And we are also trying to um, build in through workshops and through our conversations with curators uh, trying to give them a bit of professional mentorship so that they also learn something around how the market works and that they become more comfortable uh, talking about selling artwork. You know, um, it's not a, it's not a dirty word because it's not our first priority. You know, we're not aggressive salespeople. It's not our bread and butter. So, but we can become a little more comfortable with it. And it supports the artists, and it, we are not able. Under, the underlying platform isn't about, oh, you know, we have a hundred million rand, and we can invite big curators and everybody, and give them stipends and give them budgets. And whatever. it's not about that. It's about saying, um, do it yourself. Like, let's get together. Let's do it ourselves. You know, and let's support each other in doing that. And so, uh, should. Um, should a show, should a curator create a show and all the photographs of the artist's cells, uh, that is a way that the curator can make up the investment that they've put in, in terms of their time, in terms of maybe paying for the framing for the artist, in terms of maybe transporting the artist's work or whatever, you know. So it's, it's an entrepreneurial model, right? Um, and so it's a bit of a hybrid between um, the art fair having become so dominant but also the art fair having excluded so many people from participating. Um, and at the same time, like, bothering a bit of that, but also remaining true to what we think the mission and the values and the work of a curator is. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll say um, to answer your question is, you know, I think it's, it's really great that there are now three art fairs in Johannesburg this week from having one main art fair that for you know for many reasons that that's how it has that that's three more opportunities um, for artists for curators for art for art community for networking for all of those things you know 
So I, I think that's exciting, you know, not everybody's hyper-focused on this one thing that's happening and, you know, being part or not being part, feeling part, not feeling part, etc. Um, the show is also, I mean, I think it's like 50 rand to go to the show, so it's totally affordable. It's not about, you know, making money off tickets, uh, like, and, and I think it's free, it's, it, it is free for students and pensioners. So if you are, whoever has to buy a ticket, it's, it's an affordable ticket as well. Um, and so that's the other idea, is making it a bit more democratic and more accessible and mixing it up so that there's this mixture of really professional installations and curated shows, but also just really fun and relaxed and more of a, you know, um, more of an experience. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. I went into a bit of detail, but Final question. Hi, I'm Boshe, Sweden from, yeah, Boshe, Sweden. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I wanted to ask a question like, like what advice would you give an aspiring curator? One advice. One advice. <laughs> One. Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 team, my team is efficient. But yes, I said, no, you want to just like that in a nutshell, just, <laughs> yeah, well. <sure>. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus. Practice, practice, and practice, you know, that, that, that's it, that also, practice, practice, and practice. It's the advice that you would give to a pianist mm -hmm. who wants to be a classical, you know, pianist, the advice you give to a writer, that just practice. You, I mean, like I said, for six years I've been doing this. I went from totally, if you were here in the beginning and you caught my disastrous story about my first show, to yeah. this Ford Foundation show, which was like spectacular, off the charts. I've had everything in between, you know? And you, you, you just practice. It, you, it, it's your craft, it's your profession. Practice makes perfect. So um, we have to bring this to an end. We've got a series of incredibly interesting book launches that's coming up. Um, I want to really thank Natasha in the middle of a very hectic schedule for sitting down with us. I'm going to give her all these questions because she didn't answer half of them, so uh, that she can like I'd love to see the Yeah, no, you can. Do, you can all you record them and send them. We put them on an archive. Oh, right? okay. Yeah, no, we're serious about our shit. <laughs> <laughs> But the later you finish the other light show. Yes, thank you. So uh, thank you very much again, um, not just for the talk, but also for the work that you do. That is an incredible part, uh, I think, of the New York scene and also of, of South African, of the South African scene as well. Um, I think you make an, an, you know, you, the thoughtfulness with which you approach your practice uh, is incredible, and which is why we wanted to have you here. Well, it's a great honor for me to be here after missing out on the last two, and so it really is my pleasure, Charlene. And thank you all for being an amazing audience, um, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and I feel really energized by this, you know, so it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that kind of gives me a little bit of a boost, you know, as we carry on, so um, I appreciate it as much being here with you guys. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, the NRF National Research Foundation, to Tuka Fund, uh, to Wits University, um, to the Wits School of the Arts and the Department of Finance that, that provides us with so much assistance to be able to do this. And of course to all of you, because if we don't have the audience, uh, you know, we just talk between ourselves. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for being here and for coming. <laughs>